When I told Dr. Shirley that I was introducing him, he said, keep it short. But how can I keep it short with someone as given, as community driven, as accomplished as he is? Someone who does this, I think, because it needs to be done. At any rate, Dr. Aaron Shirley is a pioneer in healthcare and the development of school-based clinics for adolescent care. An alumnus of Tougaloo College and Meharry Medical School, he completed his residency in pediatrics in 1967 at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. In 1979, Dr. Shirley initiated a healthcare clinic within an inner city school which has served as a model for school-based clinics nationwide. He was instrumental in developing the Jackson Hines Comprehensive Healthcare Clinic, serving over 40,000 low-income patients a year. More recently, he founded the Jackson Medical Mall to provide healthcare while revitalizing Jackson. Dr. Shirley has been involved in Mississippi Action for Progress, the Mississippi Association of Community Health Care for the Poor, and several health centers. He is chairman of the board of the Jackson Medical Mall Foundation and is an associate professor of pediatrics and director of community medical services at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. He has served on the National Health Insurance Advisory Committee the President Clinton's Health Care Reform Task Force in 1993, and the Citizens Health Care Working Group, which reported to Congress in 2006. He was selected as a MacArthur Fellow in 1993. In 2007, Dr. Shirley was a Mississippi Majesty Honoree, and in 2009, he received the Governor's Initiative for Volunteer Excellence Award. An endowed chair at the University of Mississippi Medical Center is named in his honor. Dr. Shirley continues to work on innovative programs for reducing health disparities in Mississippi. His healthcare model for Hines County is currently being reviewed for possible replication through the Robert Woolett Johnson <coughs> Communities in Charge program. In 2010, he founded the Health Connect program modeled on a similar program in Iran, which sends doctors and nurses to rural homes to help prevent unnecessary emergency room visits. This project was the New York Times Magazine cover story in July 2012. Dr. Shirley was born in Gluckstadt, Mississippi in, 19, in 1933. He is married to Ollie Shirley and they have four children. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Dr. Aaron Shirley. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it is really my, a pleasure to be here. And, uh, you know, I think I'm supposed to talk about health disparities, right? And uh, I'm I got to speak with, to the students because we got other folks here who already know about all that kind of stuff, you know? And um, as students, you may not have been exposed to the whole idea of health disparities. So let me, let me, let me, let me see if I can bring it down to, to earth where you can connect with the meaning. I have a little piece of paper here. It's a map of Mississippi. And on this piece of paper, there are 49, 49 kidney dialysis sites that's sponsored by one company, okay? The, the need for the dialysis in many, many cases, more than 95% of the cases, 
could be prevented if individuals in these counties where this company has set up dialysis unit, if the individuals who lost their kidneys had access to appropriate health care, and most of these kidneys fail because individuals, primarily blacks, had hypertension and or diabetes that was not diagnosed early enough or was not treated appropriately to the point where the complications of those diseases led to kidney failure, which results in this company realizing that there was a lot of money to be made by dialyzing kidneys. So I mentioned that, and most of these sites are along the Mississippi River. And that's where most, the majority of the blacks in Mississippi are concentrated, especially low income, who do not receive the appropriate health care. So when we talk about disparities in Mississippi, racial disparities, some of it is geographic, but our interest is primarily racial. So for more than 50 years, I have been exposed to health problems in black patients that don't exist to the same degree as they do in white people. For instance, the disparities we look at in terms of race, the ones that stand out, has to do with, I mentioned diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, like heart disease, heart attacks, stroke, obesity, low birth weight and infant mortality. In most cases, those conditions exist at least at a rate that's twice in blacks as it is in whites. It might be various, varying to some degree, and they exist, and, it, and it's been that way since I've been here practicing. Uh, in 1960, if we looked at the gaps in most of those areas, infant mortality, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, cardiovascular disease, if you looked at, if there was a graph, you would look at a map of a graph of some sort, and you would see a gap like this, like this, okay? The occurrence of those, or the incidence of those conditions would be like this. So those conditions exist at a less amount among whites than they do among, among blacks. It's been that way. Okay. Over those years, there's been tons of money poured into Mississippi for the stated purpose of closing that gap. All right? <clears throat> tons, millions. Uh, at least 100 
and $2 million over the last 10 years to one agency in the Mississippi Delta. The first of those 10 years, the gap was like this, okay? After $102 million to that agency for the purpose of closing that gap, after 10 years and $102 million, not only did the gap not close, as a matter of fact, they get widened a bit. Okay? So, I have to be careful, but you gotta wonder. If you're, from, if you're from Mississippi, you've heard of plantations, right? Have you, uh, any of you know of a plantation or know of someone who was a grandparent or somebody who was raised on a plantation or a sharecropper? Okay. Sharecropping plantation is a structure in which there is an, an owner of a lot of land. And in Mississippi, in most cases, the owner is a white person. And low income, primarily blacks in the Mississippi Delta, <coughs> reside on those plantations. And they work the fields, they gather the crops, they pick the cotton, and they are allowed to live on that plantation. At the whim of the owner, in the early days of the 60s, when you heard about the civil rights that this structure represents. If you resided on that plantation, and if you wanted to exercise your right to vote, or go to an integrated school, or didn't do what the owner said, then you could summarily be put off the plantation. So those individuals who resided on the plantation, adults, if they wanted to exercise their right to vote, if the plantation owner was not sympathetic, then that person could just tell you to leave in the middle of the night or any time, just leave. Okay, so that's the plantation structure. And the reason that that $102 million that I mentioned that was poured into that one agency for the stated purpose of closing that gap was administered in a way of a plantation so that Persons who receive those dollars implemented programs in a way that the plantation owner ran his plantation, which meant those programs that were designed to close the gap, if those programs conflicted with an interest of that plantation owner, say for instance, if uh, I mentioned the kidney failure, if the program 
that those dollars were in any way would be effective to the point of reducing the need for dialysis by better controlling that diabetes and the hypertension and other problems that cause the kidneys to fail in the first place, then the owner of this company that makes millions and millions of dollars that by treating those individuals whose kidneys have failed could call the plantation owner and say, hey, you are helping to reduce the need for my product. <coughs> what do you mean? Well, the program that you are that's seeking funding, if that program is successful in reducing the need in treating diabetes and hypertension that causes the need for more dialysis, then I got a problem. And the plantation owner or the recipient of the $102 million probably in more cases than we'd like to think about, we think twice about seeing to it that some of that $102 million that went for closing this gap, we think twice before closing a gap that might reduce the need for this guy's product. Make sense? So, over the years, the money keeps pouring, and that as long as that conflict exists, and there's nothing to break that cycle. We'll keep pouring it in that same spigot, and we keep getting the same result. The gap 10 years from now, another 100, 200, 300 million dollars that people who write grants real well using the bad statistics that exist amongst our people in order to get the money under the pretext of doing something about it. The 102, two, 300 million go through that same spigot, we get the same result. 10 years from now, you go to medical school, you come back, you practice medicine, and your patients, most of them gonna be black, believe it or not. Your patients going out, that's it, you're gonna see that same gap. Now, to be fair, I think it, I must say that sometimes I have, well, this time I have blamed, placed some of the blame on some of our problems on the plantation owner, or that concept. Or I've kind of given up a race angle, tinge. But some of our problems, disparities are self-inflicted. Okay? Let's take Is that you? <laughs> okay. Sometimes it's self-inflicted. Let's take diabetes. Okay. In many instances, diabetes is related to sometimes some genetics involved, but it's related in many instances to lifestyle, obesity, not enough exercise, very poor dietary habits, 
okay? And we're seeing more and more of that among young people, very young people. In, in my early days of practice of pediatric, it was very, very seldom that we see a 15-year-old, a 16-year-old with what we call adult diabetes that's not related to inheritance. Now we're beginning to see the diabetes that we old people, that <laughs> was reserved for us old folks some time ago, we're beginning to see that diabetes in 16, 17 years old. And in most instances, it's secondary to obesity, dietary, bad lifestyle, dietary habits. And can't blame that on the plantation owner. If we look at many of the population pockets where we find our folks, children, and young adults with diabetes, we'll find that the dietary habits are contribute a great deal to it. And when those of you, I see some of you sitting here, who have tried to intervene and correct some of the bad eating habits. We run into not resistance, but just uh, an inability to change a culture. Now, what I mean by that? Uh, All of you now or at one time have had grandparents, right? And I would bet when you go visit grandparents in your generation, or my, in my generation, when you go to visit grandparents, the grandparent was usually a mature, senior type who cook, and they love to cook, and the grandchildren come, I got to fix some, my grandchild some fresh green, right, I got some fruit, I got some, I just got to fix a meal for my grandbaby my grandchild. You go off to college, you go home, and then you go visit your parents, and then you go visit your grandparents, and then you get a good home-cooked meal that includes the kinds of stuff that we recommend most of the time. Okay? Now, what if, what if, what if that grandparent was 28, 29 years old? <laughs> huh? Okay, well, I just have to go over to my great grandmama's house. Okay? And you go over to great grandmama's house. Great grandmama ain't but 45. <laughs> <laughs> you think of Ken? And guess what? You go and open the refrigerator 
of great grandmothers. You all seen the first green. You all see almost nothing fresh. You'd see, look out the window, you'll see a <clears throat> fast food something right down the street. And you're talking about cooking, are you crazy? <laughs> That's why you came to see me? All you wanted was me to cook? Child, I don't do that. Okay? That's self-inflicted. That is self-inflicted. And this culture I talked about is, I can talk about it because I'm guilty of having help created by fighting for better nutrition for children that created things like the WIC program, the uh, school lunch program, the school breakfast program, and those th kind of things that kind of relieve parents of the responsibility of cooking. It wasn't more than three weeks ago I was in an elementary school in Jackson, sitting in the principal's office, waiting for a meeting. And while I was sitting there, there was a young student kind of across from me, looking at the floor. And it was obvious that he was unhappy. And after 15 minutes, I just couldn't take it anymore. And I went and sat next to him. And I was uh, determined to just try to create a conversation with him. So it went something like this. Hi, my name is Aaron Shirley. He didn't look up. I say, my name is Aaron. You want to talk? He said, yeah. I said, you don't look very happy. He kind of shook his head. I said, you don't like school? He shook his head. And by this time, there was a clerk who noticed that I was over there. And she said to me, oh, he does this all the time. And we're waiting for his mother to come pick him up. Okay? She, and the clerk says, almost every day, when his mother brings him, he doesn't want to get out of the car. And he comes in the school, and it's obvious he doesn't want to be here. So we've told, called her to come pick him up. So, I say, okay. I say to the young fellow, I say, uh, are you hungry? They say, yeah. I said, did you have breakfast this morning? He said, no. And then the clerk said again. Yeah, that's another problem because he's supposed to take his medicine for it. I supposed to eat before he take his medicine. Okay, so what did that say? Here was a child with a parent. I didn't see the mother. I didn't meet the mother. But they had a parent who obviously couldn't, wouldn't, or whatever, beat this child before he went to school because we had set the stage for the school having the responsibility for feeding my child. Now, what do you mean asking me about whether my child ate breakfast? It ain't your business. You are the school, and the school is supposed to feed my children. Well, what about the medicine? 
Well, you give him that too, I'll bring the Bible. Okay? So I said to the clerk, I said, you know what? I suspect there are some issues that if we dig a little deeper, we'll find out that this child's going to need some help. And by this time, the principal showed up and saved me because I was about to start meddling. <laughs> I was about to get the address of this child, and I was going to pay personal visit to this child's home and just kind of try to make some friends, find out if I could be of some help, find out what kind of medicine the child was on, if he took it like he was supposed to, try to convince the mama that, you know, we could, he could, he doesn't have to be unhappy. But she saved me from that. But I haven't forgotten, so much so that I have from him promised myself, I'm going to do a follow-up. And I would suspect that that kind of scenario is repeated over and over and over, school by school by school. And some of the kids who end up with chronic illnesses like diabetes and eventually hypertension, heart disease, and other disparities that we talk about, aren't caused by the plantation owner. It's caused by the entitlement mentality is that I don't cook. It's your responsibility as a school feed my child, teach my child, and in many instances, clothe my child. That is another contributor of disparities. How much time? Tell me, because I want to talk about one more thing. Another contributor of disparity is just outright ideology that's so ingrained in some of our policy makers and elected officials who will say, if my state has 300,000 adults who do not have insurance, that I will not accept any money to make it just to tell it like it is. That's totally free that will insure these people. Now, we're not talking about old people, blind people, uh, lazy people. We're talking about people who work every day, a little better than minimum wage, if that. No health insurance, 45 years old guy who's Blood pressure is way out of whack. Doesn't know it because it has no symptom. Doesn't go and get regular checkups because that costs money. And that regular checkup would identify the di diabetes early. I mean, that hypertension early, get it under control, and prevent this 45-year-old three years later from losing his kidney. And if we insure this guy, then he is more likely to get that preventive type of treatment 
checkup that will prevent him from losing his kidneys. But I'm not going to accept money if it has fingerprints on it or picture on it or anything on it that says Obama. I just ain't going to take it. You can do what you want with it. I'm not going to take it. And it's that kind of nonsense that's going to cause that gap that we're talking about to, to continue to exist. I've had opportunity to engage our government with an opportunity for the state of Mississippi to receive some funding to do some planning to help close this gap. Free money. All the governor had to do was say, I want it. Or he could say, I don't want it, but send it anyway. And the response was, anything, anything out of the Obama administration, I will not accept. Now, I was not sharp enough or wise enough or whatever you call it. It took me a while to realize what he was saying. So I wanted to send something back and say, what if the president issued an executive order renaming oxygen Obama? <laughs> Would you stop breathing? <laughs> you know? And it's that kind of mentality. And if you look and dissect his rhetoric, it's obvious that in his mind, and he plants it in the minds of certain people, Tea Party types, and low income whites, who also would benefit from the expansion of healthcare. He plants in it the way he you look at his rhetoric. If some of you in political science or something like that, you can, what class is what class is this a class of what? This is just junk students who came out of here so they didn't have to be somewhere else. Okay? <laughs> listen to the rhetoric. The implication is, just listen to his rhetoric. The implication is, these benefits go to those people. That's right. And here's people who believe everything he said. Says, it kind of reminds me of back when we had more honest prejudices. When the first round of minimum wage, the state of Mississippi resisted implementing a mandatory minimum wage, and the rhetoric that was used by the honest politicians was, you know, and he was talking to whites who were making $35 an hour. He was telling them, you know, if we raise the minimum wage to $50, mandatory, those people are going to be making the same thing as you. I'm serious. And about it, 
They said, well, then getting from 35 to 50, and those folks going to have the same thing. I just they keep my 35. But in those days, they were honest about it. Now they hide it. They hide it. And if you, some of the classes, I hope, there's some Berenski types around on this campus. I hope they will have an opportunity to help you digest some of the policy and digest some of the, the reasons for some of the policies that continues to drive that gap. I think I ought to leave some room for some questions. I hope I've made some people mad, and I hope. <laughs> Are there any questions for Dr. Shirley? Uh, if so, the room is small enough where we, uh, you can stand where you are and ask him those questions. Yeah, I'm Steve Reisman. I do political science here and I run our Center for Civic Engagement and Civic Responsibility. And I've tried to work with some of the good people in Health and Wellness Center and Natural Sciences and elsewhere to try to get the cafeteria to have a better selection of food. It's worked to a great extent. The cafeteria has brought in more vegetarian items more uh, vegetables in general. It's done a good job over the last few years. What disappoints me in relation to what you're saying is that a lot of the students have developed the habit of choosing the food that promotes obesity, that really is empty calories, and doesn't contribute to good health. Now, some students, that's not the case. But I get the cafeteria, I get in that line, a lot of students are choosing food very different from what I choose, and I like to think the food I choose is healthier food. You wanna comment on that at all? That's a tough one. Um, for the, the scientists who talk about taste, and stuff like that, and uh, becoming kind of locked into desire for certain taste. Uh, I think if we could find a way to narrow down the choices, <laughs> you know, and then we got organizations that would challenge that, <laughs> and we got parents and others who would challenge that. But I think this might be one way to do it, is to kind of now the choice is down and eat this or go hungry. <laughs> uh, 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 then if at one time Tugaroo had gates, if you close the gate, <laughs> you close, lock the gate, and uh, that's all you can get, you know, is what's here. And you can't run down, you know. And get that other stuff. I, I don't know. That's a tough one. That's, that's going to be a tough one. Okay, there's a question. Uh, mm. uh, just a comment. Uh, just, uh, Dr. Dyson, sometimes the kids will choose some of the food that they choose that's right then and there because some of them maybe be like busy, you know, throughout the whole day of studying classes. So they have to get some something right then and there and, and put it in their mouth, not taking the time out saying, okay, well, let's pick a salad. And, this is healthier, or let's get these bag of chips or this can and eat it and hold out to tonight and make boil a couple of noodles or something like that. <laughs> some, sometimes it, sometimes you have to eat what's right being in the mirror. Okay, sometimes they choose it. Yeah, they choose it all the time. It's, it's one, one thing related to it, I can't let this slide. There, there are also some economic issues. If you eat the way we would desire you to eat, in many instances, it costs you more. And many of the uh, folks on fixed income, marginal 
it's, it's much more difficult for them to eat what we recommend than it is to eat a pig pie. No? <laughs> Uh, I have both a comment and some concerns. Um, and so the, the concerns are that uh, our records indicate that not enough of the students on campus take advantage of the Health and Wellness Center. And uh, we have targeted the survey trying to find out why that is. Uh, we are trying to get our young people moving to eliminate sedentary behavior, not just among students, but among our uh, members of all ages. However, my interest is in the older adult the rural community, uh, chronic illnesses, and you talked about money that used to be poured into Mississippi and was not used for its purpose intended. I find it hard as I try to research and get proposals and grants to be able to support the programs that we're working with to find money. Uh, yet I'm told that it's out there, it's just not, I'm having difficulty finding it. What kind of money, bottom line question, is being poured into Mississippi now and is it uh, being used for its purposes intended? Today. That uh, $102 million spigot has been closed. That one is no longer pouring. I don't know what the alternative to that. I don't think the money is going to stop, but the, the pathway will probably be different. I think you got some deaf people who might know a little more about what's, what's going to be available. But that's. Okay, we have uh, two questions uh, from Brown University. So these were Brown asked me to ask you a couple of questions. The first one was what impact do you think the Affordable Care Act of 2010 will have? on how we can more broadly and effectively offer health care services and resources to underserved populations. The Affordable Care Act has the potential for offering insurance coverage to a little more than a third of the individuals in the state who currently do not have insurance, okay, through the expansion of Medicaid. And our policymakers, our governor, lieutenant governor, legislature, all say we will not expand Medicaid. And they hide behind a whole lot of unrational excuses. On the one hand, this is kind of a long answer, but uh, this, this is kind of passionate. On the one hand, they will brag about money from the same treasury that goes to Madison to create 100 jobs, okay, while at the same time refusing to accept millions of dollars that will do more than just create 100 jobs, it will create several thousand jobs while at the same time helping to reduce the long-term costs to the state and federal government in terms of chronic illnesses. It just, it just, it's just, you know, it just doesn't, and then we buy it. We got people who will buy it. Yeah, 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 Governor, we don't want that. The other, the other question they asked me to ask you was, uh, what are the 
ask you was, it is clear that we need to encourage more students from diverse backgrounds to pursue careers in public health, medicine, and biomedical research to become the next generation of health leaders in our society. How can universities and colleges play a larger role in identifying and supporting students who wish to pursue careers in these important areas? What support systems and resources need to be in place? <laughs> let's start with this group. Let's start with finding students who have a passion to serve, you know? Uh, and then I think there are more and more opportunities for support of institutions in terms of scholarships and other resources to promote students who really have the passion to serve. Now, and, and if that passion is not there, I'm on the Tea Party side. You know, don't take the money, take advantage of the resource, go off and get all kind of training and specialization and stuff, and then go somewhere and to live high on the hall rather than serve the people who need you. I think. I'm Norma Williams. I work in the uh, Health and Physical Education and Recreation Department. Are you going into the high schools looking for students who might be interested in going into the, this area? Uh, we are. We, we got the group right now in the mall that we're working with after school. Uh, and we're holding hands, and we're pushing. And we've even uh, dipped into the pool of public assistance individuals. And we've plucked a few of those out. And we have uh, at least two now who are community health worker instructors <laughs> at Jackson State. And we're pushing, but it takes, you know, I had somebody pushing me when I came to Tougaloo. I, I had somebody saying, you're going to Tougaloo, you're going to make good grades, you're going to medical school. No, you know, well, how am I going to do that? I don't have any money. You, you're going. But right now, if, you, if we don't have somebody to just push them and say, you're going to do it, you're going to do it, you're going to do it, that's what it's taking. But yeah, we are. We, we are. And I'm sure there are others. Aren't there others? Yeah. Kevin Anderson, I'm a freshman here at Tulu College, and I just wanted to know if you have any comments about our cafeteria, because we have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but our dinner is at 4 o'clock right now, and it's basically some of the kids here on campus have to eat. It's like our last chance to eat, and after that period of time, like, everyone walks around, <laughs> you know, there was a time when college students were innovative. Uh, when I was a student here, that was a long time ago, uh, we had a, what you call it? Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, but anyway, uh, as a matter of fact, my frat, the way we survived was we did hot dogs. And uh, the frat did. We, I mean, we did hot dogs and it went well. But anyway, uh, if you want me to identify some of my, my buddies who know how to do that kind of stuff, <laughs> I bet you they would be tickled there if there's some innovative or if there's some site they could set up a something, I bet you I could get somebody to come up here. And this is, I don't, you know, I don't, I saw the president here a minute ago, but 
<laughs> but uh, that one can be solved. The student's got to change this man. Do they? Health and wellness, I would think uh, there a little food prep place in there? No, we do without the In that building? We do water. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Dr. Sterling, you know, we also have town hall meetings, and these kind of issues probably need to be brought up at the town hall meeting as well as far as cafeteria hours and other solutions to that. So we're taking note of it. Come see me, man. Come see me, man. <laughs> I do have a question for you, Doctor. Yeah. Um, given Dr. White read your resume, and it was just a short sneak peek of what you've done over the years in healthcare and healthcare delivery, how did you navigate an often hostile environment, even with the Medicaid expansion issue that you that you're hearing about now? In the past, how have you navigated? some of the most hostile political environments to be successful and introduce some of the most innovative things that you've done here in Mississippi to address uh, health disparities? Uh, I think just being persistent and trying to live up to what was expected of me when, I, when my parent invested Tougaloo invested, Meher invested, and my having an opportunity to serve, and uh, just kind of having grown up, grown up in Mississippi, knowing, uh, just being persistent, and doing it out of here, not out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Shirley will be available at the end for small reception. And if you have more questions, um, you can see him outside. But in the interest of time, and with Brown being an hour ahead of us, uh, we're going to conclude now. But let me say, Dr. Shirley, on behalf of the Brown Tugalu Partnership, thank you so much. Uh, this was outstanding. Let's give him, him another round of applause. everything that needed to be said okay. and I'm so glad that you took some of some of your time away from being in that Jackson Medical Hall to visit with us today. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Okay.